I'll have to edit that. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, motion in one dimension. So what we're going to talk about today, so this is a brief overview. We're going to talk about frames of reference. If you don't know what a frame of reference is, uh, are you sitting still or moving? Yeah, you're, depends on the frame of reference, right? If we're in the frame of reference of my classroom, you're sitting still. But if we're on the sun, man, we're really moving fast, okay? Average velocity, that's the average distance divided by the time. Instantaneous velocity, how fast you're going in that instant. Acceleration, change in velocity. Motion at a constant acceleration, that's a nice little thing that we like to do in physics because it's easy. Very rare, though. And then solving problems. Free fall, that's uh, dropping stuff in Earth's atmosphere usually. We'll probably have a couple problems where we do Mars and uh, the moon or whatever. And then there's a graphical analysis of linear motion. So any measurement of position, distance, or speed must be made with respect to the reference of, uh, of where you're at. So if we were on a train, right, and you're sitting still inside the train, the person sitting across from you will seem like they're sitting still. Um, but if you're outside the train, man, it looks like you're really moving fast. And so they give this example. There's two people sitting across from each other. Here they are. Hi, Linda, how are you? I'm doing okay. Oh, that's great. Wait, why did Linda have the deep voice? I don't know. All right, so anyways, that's fine. So the train's moving this way. This guy's moving this way. Um, so it's relative, right? It's relative with respect to your frame of reference. That's, that's what we use. So then we can make a distinction between the distance and displacement. Displacement is how far an ob object is from its starting point. So that's a technical term, okay? Distance is how far you traveled or along a path. It's very technical. Um, displacement, if I walk, if I stand up and I walk over here and I come right back to here, how much have I been displaced? Zero, right? But what's the distance I traveled? I traveled over here, whatever this value is, and then I traveled over here, whatever this value is. So there's a distance that I traveled but the displacement would be zero. So one is tracking where you start, where you end. The other one is kind of tracking how much distance you've traveled, right? And that's why we use distance for, well, distance, okay? Any questions so far? Okay, good. So now displacement is written as delta x is equal to x sub two minus x sub one. Uh, we'll do a bunch of example problems, but for now, just kind of accept that's the formula. Delta, the Greek letter delta, looks like a triangle. That always represents change and, or an incremental. So this is really the displacement, which is the difference between a starting x position and an ending x position. So if I start here, this is x sub 1. This is where I started. That's my first value of x on the x axis. And then I walk for a little bit, and I stop here. That's my second x position. Now, if I wanted to figure out how far I went, I'm going to take the second x position and subtract it from the first. So 30 minus 10 equals 20. And it's just coincidence that that's the way it works. So then speed, how far an object travels in a given time, is something that we can measure. Now, average speed is the distance traveled versus the time elapsed. Average velocity is a different thing. That's displacement. Now I'm gonna say this, and it's not gonna make a whole lot of sense to you guys at first, but we're talking about vectors and we're talking about scalars, okay? Velocity is a vector, okay? And speed, it's a measurement. So what's the difference between a measurement and a vector? Well, a vector is a measurement with a direction, okay? It's a magnitude and a direction, where speed is more like a magnitude. Now, these are averages, so, so it's time elapsed. So very similar, though, 
for, uh, for velocity, you're going to take your final position, which will be x sub 2 minus x sub 1 over the total time, which will be t2 minus t1. So velocity then, if we look at this, uh, is delta x over delta t. And I don't, did you guys cover limits in pre-calc? Well, this is the algebra-based physics, but basically what it means is that it's going to be your displacement, delta x, remember that's what we learned just a second ago, uh, over delta t. Now, instantaneous speed is in that instant. So if a car is driving down the road and I take a picture of it, I'm capturing that moment in time. When you look at the picture, it doesn't look like he's going fast, but he is. He could be going 60 miles an hour. I don't know. So instantaneous speed is how fast are they going at that instant. Most of the measurements that you guys are accustomed to are not instantaneous. They're averages. So when you get in your car and you're going 65 miles per hour, that's on an average. It's calculating how many revolutions your tire made and over a certain period of time, but it's not instantaneous, okay? So the graph shows a couple different things. So this is velocity kilometers per hour, and it's 40 kilometers per hour. Now this is an average velocity where the speed could be 40 miles. This is realistic, right? The average velocity is 40, not miles, 40 kilometers per hour, but a car realistically starts from a stopping position, speeds up, ramps up to speed, maybe goes down and has uh, to, to slow down, gets on the highway or something, and then averages out and then they slow down and stop. So this is, this is more like what you guys are used to. Uh, well, I just now looked at the time, so it, they're traveling for a half hour here. Um, very rarely will you see something like this. This is a constant velocity. When you graph a constant velocity, it's a flat line. This is a varying velocity. So then acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. So acceleration is a change in velocity over time. Okay. So here I have my initial time. And in my initial time, I'm, I've got zero seconds have passed. When I first start the timer, my initial velocity is the car moving? No, it's sitting still. So my initial velocity is zero. And then a second later, when t equals one second later, my velocity is 15 kilometers per hour. That gives me an acceleration of 15 kilometers per hour. Now, if it's a constant rate of acceleration, then a second later, my velocity increases by 15 kilometers per hour. And then if you keep doing that at five seconds, I should be going 75 kilometers per hour, which is pretty fast if you convert that to miles per hour, okay? So we're measuring all those things. Um, acceleration is a vector. Although in one dimension motion, we can use the sign. So it's either positive or negative. We can choose what we make negative or positive. So if I have a car that has a, a negative acceleration and a positive velocity, my car is slowing down. If I have acceleration in the same direction as the velocity, then my car is speeding up. So acceleration is a vector but in the previous image shows a positive acceleration, so here's a negative acceleration. This is like hitting the brakes. If my car is going 15 meters per second, which is really fast, and I hit the brakes, my acceleration is a change in velocity in the negative direction. That's going to take a little getting used to. But if I don't have any acceleration, I won't have any change. Now when they say vector, a vector is a way that we can display our magnitude of the variable and the direction. So this green arrow pointing in this positive direction, think of a number line, it's pointing in the positive x direction. It's longer, so this green arrow is representing 15 units per second, where this one is representing representing negative two. So it's a shorter arrow because it's only representing a shorter magnitude, which is two, 
and it's pointing in the negative direction. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll dive deep on that. So now there's a difference between negative acceleration and deceleration. Negative acceleration is an acceleration in a negative direction as defined by the coordinate system. Deceleration occurs when the acceleration is opposite the direction of the velocity. So I can choose to have a velocity going this way in the negative direction and my acceleration be positive, but it opposes the velocity. Now you say, well, what, is, what does that mean, Mr. Adams? Well, if I think of a number line and the car goes this way, a better way to do it is just look at me real quick. I'm moving this way, but if I slow down, I'm accelerating in that direction. But if I choose for this to be, which is your guys' left, this is a negative velocity, but my acceleration is positive. But now if I go this way and then I speed up, both are going in the same direction. So when we talk about deceleration, we're not talking about a negative acceleration. We're talking about an acceleration that opposes the velocity. It slows it down. You can have a negative velocity. It means you're going really, really fast in the negative direction or positive direction, and then really, really fast in the negative direction. Does that make sense? No, that's OK. Once you do a bunch of problems, it will. Okay. So now instantaneous acceleration is the average acceleration in the limit as the time interval becomes infinitesimally small. So basically you got to use calculus to find this. But acceleration um, instant can happen instantaneously just like velocity can be instantaneous, right? Because your acceleration doesn't just automate. When you hit the brakes, your acceleration or deceleration when you hit the brakes, because you're accelerating in the opposite direction of the motion or velocity, it is an instant. You ramp that up too. So if I wanted to know what an acceleration or deceleration is in an instant in time, I have to do some fancy calculus. So a lot of times you guys are used to average velocity as an object time so it's delta t over or i'm sorry delta x over delta t so instead of saying x sub 2 x sub 1 you might just say x and x naught where x is the final position and x naught now x naught is x sub 0 0 represents nothing so you'll hear some people say x naught I, I, I will interchange all of them because I want you guys to be familiar with all of them, okay? Um, and then T and T naught, or the final time minus the initial time. So acceleration assumed constants, a con you can make the assumption that the acceleration is constant, and that's just the final velocity minus the initial velocity over time, or V minus V naught over T. So most, motion at a constant acceleration is what we start you guys off with because it's kind of easy. And it's a good approximation for most things. So my average velocity then could just be the final velocity plus the initial velocity divided by 2. Well, if you combine all these equations using some sort of system of equation, you can get that x is equal to x naught plus the average velocity uh, times time, or x naught plus the initial velocity plus the final velocity divided by 2 times time, or the initial position plus the initial velocity plus the initial vo velocity plus um, acceleration times time over 2, or you get this kinematic equation that your position your final position is equal to your initial position plus the initial velocity times time plus one half times the acceleration times your time squared. Whew, that's a lot, okay? But what they did is they plugged this in, you start off with this, plug that in, and then you work backwards. Um, so you could kind of get the same thing by doing a bunch of other stuff. 
In other words, you could get the final velocity squared is equal to the initial velocity squared plus 2 times the acceleration times uh, delta x. So anyways, these are known as the kinematic equations. And basically, they're taking those two or three first initial equations and solving them for v or solving them for x and solving them for v squared and so on and so forth. Now, your challenge in your homework is you're not going to know which equation to use. Most of these equations have three variables. They're going to give you one variable, and you're going to have to solve for another variable. And then you'll eventually have two variables, and you can solve for the third. Um, that's the trick. So how do you solve a physics problem? Well, you read the whole problem, make sure you understand it, then read it again. You're going to read the problem, do some work, read the problem again, do some work, read the problem again. That's how it works. Sorry. Uh, then you decide on the objects under study and what the time interval is. Next, you're going to draw a diagram, and you're going to choose the coordinate axis. I could draw an axis that's horizontal. I could draw it vertical. I could draw it on a slope like this. Right? I could draw it at an angle. I'm going to follow the path of motion, and I'm going to determine if I want it to be positive or negative, depending on what suits me. Next, I'm going to write down all the known quantities and then the stuff that I don't know. Then I usually list the equations that have all the variables, right? Um, so you'll have like, okay, I know x, I know y, or, or no, in one dimension it'll be, I know the final position, I know the initial position, I know the initial time, I don't know the final time, and I know the acceleration. And once you write all that out, you'll go, oh, only this equation will work. And that's how you solve it. And then what uh, uh, physics are being applied? Um, another thing is that which the equations that you use are related to the known and unknown. Um, algebraically, you, if you have two unknowns, how many equations do you need? Two. If you have three unknown variables, then you need three equations. Okay? And then you, uh, you go through and you do the math, and then you get a result. When you're done with the whole thing, you've got to make sure it makes sense. You're going to do a lot of unit conversions. So if I said to you, my car is going, uh, tell me the speed of Mr. Adams' car as I leave the school, and I go down the road, and I give you a bunch of information, and you use physics to calculate my speed, and the answer comes back 2,000 miles per hour. Somewhere you made a mistake. So I like to call it a common sense check. So maybe you used the wrong formula. Maybe you didn't convert the units right. So at the end, I always go, well, does, well, does that seem possible? Okay. Lastly, our free-falling objects. Um, free-falling objects, the acceleration is considered to be constant. It isn't really, but we could do a lot of the calculations that way. And so... Um, that acceleration is due to gravity, lowercase g, 9.8 meters per second. So in the absence of air resistance, objects fall with the same acceleration. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be a piece of paper or a softball or a piece of trash in a vacuum. Now, if you have a feather and you have a hammer, the feather has a lot more air resistance it won't fall the same. Did you guys see that Mythbusters where they went into the vacuum and they put heavy stuff and dropped feathers? They fall at the same rate. Okay. Galileo is the guy that, that kind of had that belief. And they performed uh, his experiment. Uh, that's one of the experiments they did when they went to the moon. It's kind of cool. So, anyways, free falling objects, the acceleration due to Earth's, or at Earth's surface, or about sea level, it's about 9.8 meters per second second. Okay? In other words, your velocity increases by 9.8 meters per second every second. So, if I take something like this and I let go, one second later it'll be traveling at 9.8 meters per second. A second after that, it'll be 9.8 meters per second times 2, which is like 18.8. 6? No. Yeah. 19.6. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it increases. So at one second, see this chart? At one sec second, 
So this is like the velocity yeah. over time. But if it's squared, wouldn't it be like inverse? Well, it's second per second, so it's not a square. It's an inverse square. Oh. Right? And, and this, this is not square like you're thinking. It's, it, we're squaring the unit, so every second it increases by meters per second. Uh, so linear motion, one of the reasons we call it linear motion, if an object is moving at a constant velocity and we graph the position versus time, it'll make a straight line. So the velocity then is the slope of the position versus time. Okay. Uh, kinematics is a description of how objects move with respect to their defined reference of frame. Displacement is a change in position of an object. The average speed is the distance traveled by the time it took. Average velocity is displacement divided by the time. Um, instantaneous velocity is the limit as the time becomes infinitesimally small. Infinitesimally small. 